Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. Boy, does it smell good. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show. Brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. That's good. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge studio, this is Hunt Palmer. Hunt Palmer coming to you from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studio downtown in the capital city on this Thursday. Means we're brought to you by Rouse's Markets working towards the weekend. Got Jacob Beck and Cassie Spazali back there on the ones and twos. And we're going to talk to a lot of people over the next two hours. Andrew Allegretta is the voice of the Vanderbilt Commodores. He'll be with us in 15 minutes to talk about the doors as they head to Baton Rouge. Stephen Thompson covers Pittsburgh basketball for the Pittsburgh Post because that really, really big challenge for LSU tomorrow uh, up at the Greenbrier in West Virginia. It'll be a 1.30 tip, so maybe not time to get to it immediately on tomorrow's show. We'll chat with Stephen Thompson coming up in 30 minutes. I'm really interested to see how that game plays out. There's a new NFL mock draft out that we've got to get to with the Saints and Will Campbell. I'm going to talk about LSU's woes in the red zone. I have some quotes from some of LSU's players, and we will certainly uh, go into some statistics on that as well as it's been been a tough go for LSU trying to get points. Chris Blair, voice of the Tigers, with us at 2.15, and Luke Johnson back at 2.30 talking Saints with us here on the Hunt Palmer Show. We've got great news here at Guarantee Media. We're having a big Thanksgiving lunch. The entire staff brought dishes and a big Thanksgiving lunch, and what time did they serve it, Jacob Beck? Right now. One o'clock right now, which will be done in about two Two hours. hours, yeah. What food do we think will be left at that Um, point? Probably not much, I would guess. Maybe some rolls here or there. Maybe. Maybe. What what casserole might somebody bring that nobody's going to eat? Sometimes the green bean casserole Green bean casserole. My wife brought that to uh, hers. I'm I'm sure that Not that there's anything wrong with it, (laughs) but you know. It has cream and mushroom soup in it. I'm not eating that. Yeah, yeah. There's probably something with like oysters that a lot of people are going to be grossed out Oh yeah, maybe oyster dressing. Um, but we're not going to get any of it anyway. No, so it we're doesn't not. really matter. So I guess we should just put our nose to the grindstone and, and get to work. And the only way we can do that is with our, our Genesis opening drive. It's time for Hunt's opening drive, presented by Genesis of Baton Rouge. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do this segment. I, I wrestled this morning whether or not I was going to do this segment. And then I said, you know what? You need to do the segment. So we're going to do the segment. Can the Saints make the playoffs? We pronounced this team very much dead two weeks ago. They fired their head coach. They traded their best defensive asset. The whole team's hurt. Alave may not play again. Shahid's on the IL for the rest of the way. That's a baseball term. IR the rest of the way. Um, it's It looked terrible. And then they won two games. And now they're in a bye week, and we don't have an opponent to preview. So the question is, can they do enough to get there? You know the situation that they're currently standing in, and it's a bad division. I will grant you that it is a bad division. Right now, the Saints sit at four wins and seven losses. Just above them by half a game, Tampa Bay has four wins and six losses. Atlanta's atop the division at six wins and five losses. So the Saints, out of first place, two games. Okay? Now, I want to talk about these three teams, big picture, and then we'll get into what the actual numbers in the schedule say. But Atlanta looks pretty good, but the Saints did beat them once. They split that tiebreaker, the first one. Tampa is, quote-unquote, in free fall. Yes, they have lost four games in a row. Are you aware of who those games are against that Tampa has dropped? Because I will tell you, it's not exactly the easiest stretch of games that I've seen anybody play. They played Baltimore and lost by 10 points. Baltimore's one of the best teams in the league. They played Atlanta and lost by five. Falcons, solid team. Then they went to Kansas City and lost by six in a game that they could have very much won. And then they played San Francisco and lost by three. They're not getting blown out. They're competitive. They're playing playoff teams. But yeah, they've lost four games in a row, and that's why they're only a half game up on New Orleans. Now, when I look at Atlanta specifically and how the Saints match up with Atlanta, because we have completed that series of games, they split them. So now I go to the tiebreakers, and the second tiebreaker is divisional record. And the Saints only have one divisional game left. It's against Tampa. For the sake of them making the playoffs, we have to assume they're going to win that. If they lose it, they're probably not going to make the playoffs. But if they make, if they win it, they will be a perfect 3-3, three and three, a split right down the middle. They will split with all three teams. 
Atlanta has already swept Tampa and still has Carolina to play. They win that game against Carolina in week 18. They will have a better divisional record than the Saints. Therefore, it's reasonable to suggest the Saints need to beat Atlanta outright because you're not going to win a tiebreaker unless Atlanta loses to the Panthers. Sure, it could happen, but I'm not really working in those with those types of that type of mindset. Like if I was going to do that, I would just say, well, what if Atlanta loses out and the Saints win out? Well, then they're in. I'm trying to be realistic about what the possibilities are here. And I'm assuming, based on reason, that Atlanta's going to beat the Panthers. And if they do, the Saints have to beat Atlanta outright. So, Beck, work with me here as I go through Atlanta's right. schedule to decide where they're going to be. Atlanta is on a bye with the Saints this week, so we don't have to worry about that. Next up, they host the Chargers. That's a losable game. It's very losable. Chargers are good. Playing well. Then they're at the Vikings. Now, the Vikings haven't been as good, but it's a road game against a team that could make the playoffs. They could lose that game as well. Vikings are 8-2. They're good. Then they're at the Raiders. It's a road game, but the mm, Raiders are real they're bad. They're bad. I think if we're going to be realistic, let's put that one in the win column for now. They play the Giants in Atlanta. The Giants are bad. Yep. That's probably a win. Yep. They're at Washington. Very losable. Commanders are very good. Then, as we mentioned, they host the Panthers. Is it reasonable to suggest that the Falcons will win at least three games moving forward? I would say it is very reasonable. That puts them at nine. Yeah, that's tough. The Saints, to beat them outright, have to get to ten. That means you have to win out. Yeah. That's where it gets hairy. It doesn't get hairy with me suggesting that this, the Falcons could lose some of these games or the Saints could win some of these games or that the Saints could tie the Falcons because they're only two games back. It gets hairy when I've got to pass Atlanta and I realize that the odds of them losing some of these games just isn't very good. I mean, the Giants have demoted their starting quarterback to the practice squad, basically. He's inactive. I mean, that's just a mess of a situation up there. And then you look at Carolina in week 18. I mean, what kind of a what kind of a te- motivation do you have in, with that team? I mean, you, you had last year the Saints needed the Panthers to win at the end of the season. That's not going to happen. And then, you know, at the Raiders, I, they'll probably play hard. I, they're just not any good. So uh, that's that's where you kind of lose steam with can the Saints make the playoffs, no? Yeah. I um I I don't I don't know the, the, the where the the percentage. If you I don't know if you look at the ESPN probably uh, FPI or if you if if you can look at the percentages of of the chances of all these games that the Saints have left to win all of them, it's very very it's, slim. I mean, it, the and the the issue is that even if I can get past Atlanta, yeah, and say okay, well, what if Atlanta does drop that game to the Raiders and what maybe if, they, yeah maybe what if Kirk lose. Cousins gets hurt and they lose to the Giants? Like I, maybe that's that's very reasonable. You still have to deal with Tampa. And while it's it's convenient to go, well, Tampa's in free fall. They've lost four in a row. I just laid that out, what their schedule is. And then you look at what they've got coming up. They're playing this week at the Giants. I just told you how bad the Giants are. Then they play at the Panthers. It stands to reason that Tampa very well may have six wins after the next two weeks. The Saints are sitting at four. Well, then they play the Raiders the next week, too. Yeah, so they could easily at, wheel at off three. And then you still got a game with Dallas, who doesn't have a quarterback. And, the Panthers and then you still again. got the Panthers plus the Saints at home in Tampa. So it's fun to to dream and think the vibes are way better. And Rizzy's got a lot of energy. And you're gotten the offensive line healthy. And you're running the ball a little bit better. And you've lost that malaise that was Dennis Allen. And like there is reason for optimism. But I'm not going to sit here and just blow smoke. The Saints aren't going to make the playoffs. So I, I really believe if you're a Saints fan, and I have not said this for the last two weeks, but now the bye gives you a chance to reset. If you're a Saints fan, man, you can pull like heck for them in the dome against the Rams. If they lose, it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> if your goal as a Saints fan is to clean house here, and to move up as high as you can in the draft so that you're not picking 11th like the, the, the draft order says right now, and maybe you're picking 4th, and maybe, just maybe, the organization takes a chance on a starting quarterback, a quarterback of the future, because you're that high up in the draft, and either one is there where you pick, or it's easier to move up a spot, I think it's time to really have that conversation. Because 
mathematically and statistically, this doesn't look good schedule for schedule. And your salary cap situation and roster age is such that it's it's time to start really t- having that conversation. When Dennis Allen got fired, we sat here for like three days and went, this is where the Saints are, time to move forward, and we applauded the Lattimore move. And then we said, you know what? It's fine if you just go beat the Falcons. Screw them. You've lost seven in a row. It's nice to knock them down a pedestal. It's at home. Give them one shot with this interim coach who's got a lot of juice. Who cares? He stopped up the toilet. He's a cool guy. Let's go win the game. And you won the game. And then you played another bad team last week, and they came in, and you won the game. Good. Vibes are a lot better. Players are happier. Coffee tastes better at work. Water cooler's better. Maybe a po' boy tastes a little bit better. But the reality of the situation is the Saints aren't going anywhere in the next six weeks. The Saints need to make changes. And those changes are easily facilitated with a couple of losses down the stretch here and some wins by the teams that you hate the most. And that conversation sucks, but my job is to sit here, take information, and give my honest opinion about it. That's my honest opinion. It is possible that the Saints make the playoffs. It is possible the Saints beat the Rams and go to New York and win and beat Jaden Daniels in the Dome. It's possible they can go to Green Bay and win a game. It's possible the Raiders coming in are bad that we've talked about and they can win that game and maybe Tampa is in free fall and you can go to Tampa and win. The likelihood of them rattling off six in a row or five out of six is not good at all. And the likelihood that these two teams still have to play the Raiders and the Giants and the Panthers and the Cowboys. And it's just, it doesn't look good. So that's my honest opinion as we move forward. Next week, we'll sit down here and we will earnestly discuss the Saints game against the Rams and what that matchup looks like and what the Saints advantages are and what the Saints disadvantages are and what it may look like on Sunday. And then we'll come back on Monday and we'll analyze it. And hopefully Fulaga keeps playing great at left tackle and Penning keeps playing great at right tackle. And hopefully you've got some young defenders like Brzee that show up and make some big time plays. Your corners develop and you show some real pieces of what could be the next iteration of good Saints teams. But I went, I sat down with no preconceived notion and just started writing out the schedule and writing out all the stats and looking at this game for game and week for week. And I looked up the tiebreakers. And the fact of the matter is that this thing's just about cooked. That's a bucket of cold water. Apologies. It's a beautiful day outside in South Louisiana. So hopefully that helps. But that's just where I am with these New Orleans Saints right now. And that's our Genesis opening drive for today. Let's transition over to LSU and Vanderbilt. Andrew Allegretta is the voice of the Vanderbilt Commodores. He's probably had a pretty good year over this uh, this fall with Diego Pavia and company. We'll talk about this Vanderbilt team that's coming in for a Saturday night in Death Valley coming up next. The Hunt Palmer Show. One Bath and Closets. OneBathandClosets.com is the website. David Duvall and his team, 30 years redesigning and remodeling bathrooms and closets. It's holiday time. You're starting to think, what could I possibly do for a gift? How about a brand new bathroom? How about a brand new shower? Man, would that be awesome. You don't have to move to make that happen. Especially if you got one of those big 90s jacuzzi tubs with a million buttons and stuff and you never use it. Doesn't even work. Take it out. That's a lot of space. How good would a glass walk-in shower right there look? Changes the aesthetic of your bathroom. Changes the functionality of your bathroom. It's clean. It's new. Add value to your home. And you can make that happen with David Duvall and the team at One Bath and Closets. You're thinking, "Mm, paying for that right now. Well, financing options are available. 18 months, 0% if you qualify. Start the process with a free consultation with David Duvall and his team. They're at OneBathAndClosets.com. OneBathAndClosets. OneBathAndClosets.com. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. LSU and Vanderbilt will be a Saturday night in Death Valley. This is one you probably looked at months ago and thought, well, that's one we may give the tickets to the the in-laws go hunting. Not so much. These Commodores have been game all season long. Imagine it's been a fun ride for our next guest, Andrew Allegretta, voice of the Vanderbilt Commodores. Gives us some time on the Jim's Firearms Hotline. Andrew, thanks for the time. How are you? I'm doing well. So what it sounds like is the deer stands will be a little bit vacant this Saturday 
than they would have otherwise been. Is that I, what you're telling me? I can't promise that based on the uh, the last three games that LSU has played. Okay. However, they certainly have more LSU fans' attentions uh, this week than, than we may have thought uh, in terms of the results of the game. But speak to the point that I just kind of brought up. How much fun uh, has it been in Nashville this year? Oh, of course. It's been a blast. Um, I think if you're checking off bucket list items, at least for us, like first win versus Alabama since 1984, first ever win at Jordan Hare, which is a little bit surprising even for us. Of course, going back to a bowl game for the first time since 2018, uh, you've got someone that's been so captivating to watch, like Diego Pavia. If you're marching goalposts, uh, down Broadway to the Cumberland if Nate Bargetti is on SNL talking about your win versus Alabama. Uh, it's been a pretty special ride. I don't think anybody has uh, taken it for granted. Was there any inclination in August that this type of a year was, was coming? That's a good question. I think it's a fair question. Uh, I think the thing that I've kind of said throughout the course of the past couple of months is, is I went into the season not necessarily with high expectations or low expectations, I went into the season with curiosity uh, because so much was new. Um, yes, Clark Lee is back for his fourth season, uh, but the offensive coordinator is new. Clark is the defensive coordinator, which is new. You bring in a new quarterback. You bring in Jerry Kill. We don't know what the offense is going to look like. So much was new that it was hard for me to have an inkling or an expectation of something and, and rather just approach every single game with curiosity. I think the Virginia Tech game, the first one of the season, kind of put us on notice like, okay, perhaps, perhaps there's something here. Let's talk about Diego Pavia. You mentioned him there. Uh, what has it been like to watch him and call him uh, over the last three months? I, it's, it's been some of the most fun that I've had in a broadcasting booth uh, in, in my career. Um, one of the more captivating players one of the more uh, like lightning rod players on the field that you could possibly have uh, the energy, the effort like that. That's one of the things that at least from a Vanderbilt fan base, uh, fan base standpoint, what we've always wanted is someone that's going to max out their effort and their energy, right? Like we're going to sit in a position. We're going to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the top one, two, three, four recruiting classes in the country are going to go to LSU, Alabama, Georgia, but, but what the fans have always wanted is a team that maxes out its effort on Saturday and gets the most out of its talent. And, and there's no one that really embodies that more than Diego Pavia. What's amazed me is I see the highlights. I can't stand, claim to have watched every snap like you have, but I see the highlights and I see plays where he's looking like playing backyard football and using his legs, kind of running around and freelancing. And then I look at the interception numbers and it's almost none. There's three on the year. Can you speak to his creativity, his playmaking ability, but the way that he also takes care of the ball? Well, that, that's a massive priority. So Diego's thrown the least amount of interception in the Southeastern Conference, and I say that, and of course, something will happen on Saturday <laughs> for sure. Um, he, he has gotten so much better. In fact, I've kind of talked the past couple of days with Tim Beck about this, uh, the offensive coordinator for Vanderbilt. He would tell you when he first got a hold of Diego Pavia, his accuracy wasn't very good. Uh, but one of the things that he's done is, is number one, he's an outrageously hard worker since uh, getting recruited to New Mexico State back in 20, I guess it would have been 21. Um, his accuracy is, has gone way up. He still doesn't have the world's greatest arm in terms of strength, uh, but he knows what he can do with it. And the other, the other piece that I've talked with football coaches about sometimes is um, the guys that often succeed are the ones that can diagnose a picture very, very quickly and make rapid decisions and have a feel for the game. It's not just, you know, can you sit down and take this outrageous test and how smart are you, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's how well can you diagnose a picture that you see on the field. And Diego is really good at that. He's got just a, a feel um, out there for the quarterback position. He'll scramble, but he does so intelligently. Like, He's got a sense that he needs to look over his shoulder to see if he's getting tracked from behind. Uh, or, or there's times where he'll intentionally, um, there was a play versus Kentucky where he intentionally took a stack late in the ball game rather than throw the ball away so the clock would keep moving. <laughs> that, that sort of stuff is, is where Diego separates himself as a quarterback. What is We've heard the term triple option used a bunch this week uh, from LSU's players and coaches, but what is Vanderbilt trying to accomplish on offense? Uh, keep the football. 
Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, t- Tim Beck, I don't even know has a true name for what his offense is and, and what the Jerry killed Tim Beck offense is. I think at New Mexico state, they just kind of called it multiple. Um, it, it definitely has lots of option principles in there. Uh, but, but he's told me too, that they've got plays out there that look like a Mike Leach air raid type offense too. So it doesn't just sit there and, and operate like a Paul Johnson, Georgia tech triple option type thing from a handful of years ago. Um, they're, they're trying to hold on to the football. It, it's, it's designed to be third down and one and we convert, right? It's designed to get into the red zone and to have a third down and goal to go from the one and we score. Uh, and, and that's reflective in, you know, a lot of our numbers, not all of them. Um, but I still think we're top five in the conference and third down conversions. I know we're second in the conference in red zone scoring. I, I think we're still first or second in time of possession, uh, it, it is designed to be that. It is designed to be ball control and, and to do it, whether it's through the option looks uh, that you can have. But I'll, I'll tell you this, a, a lot of teams in the past handful of weeks have taken that away from us. Um, so we have struggled more. Our rushing attack has not been quite what you would like it to be. Our third downs have been third down and eight instead of third down and two. And that's created problems versus South Carolina or Auburn or Texas. So you know, teams have uh, found a way as of late to kind of constrict some of the multiple ways that Diego Pavia has been able to beat teams in the first half of the season. Who's a playmaker or two outside of Pavia that uh, Tiger fans should be acquainted with before Saturday night? Oh, Eli Stowers is is for sure the next guy out there. He's an NFL type prospect. He's a guy that came out of uh, Texas as a uh, as a uh, starting quarterback. In fact, I think when you guys play Oklahoma next week. Uh, he got hurt, Eli Stowers did, in a uh, state championship game down in Texas, and the guy that replaced him is now Oklahoma's starting quarterback, Jackson Arnold. Um, but what happened is uh, it did not pan out for Stowers at Texas A&M as a quarterback. He went to New Mexico State, eventually became a tight end, uh, and Diego Pavia and Eli Stowers are, are basically thick as thieves. Like They went to the UFC fight uh, at Madison Square Garden last weekend. Um, <laughs> on the bye weekend for Vandy. So he, he's a very skilled uh, tight end. He's up for the Mackey Award, just like Taylor is for you guys. Uh, so he, he's the number one target for Diego Pavia. If uh, if Vandy struggles to get him the football, they've got other options, but the offense will be, again, in third down and seven instead of third down and two. Let's talk defense. That's Clark Lee's side of the football. Um, my read from far away is that it's probably defense that's better than the sum of its parts. Uh, what's your read on the strength of this Vanderbilt defense? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely better than the sum of its parts. Now, having said that, I do think the talent for this defense uh, has been elevated. It's one of the conversations that uh, happened around the transfer portal and uh, about the fact that all of a sudden uh, some of the depth players that would have been at LSU or Alabama are now at Vanderbilt or elsewhere helping uh, those programs as first stringers. Um, Randon Fontenet is a dynamic uh, hybrid, you know, safety linebacker, that type of position. Uh, he's somebody that can blow up a game if he needs to. Uh, CJ Taylor is a very gifted safety. Uh, they've shown just enough with that defensive line. I think the linebackers are, are pretty good. Now the depth does get thin. Uh, so if you guys run the football, you know, we're going to, we're going to struggle toward the fourth quarter. That's what happened versus South Carolina. Um, they could not get off the field. You know, you know the, the, the whole stat of this game is probably going to be third downs defensively for Vanderbilt and offensively for LSU. Um, I, I recognize that it was kind of bits and starts uh, for you guys versus Florida, but ultimately you converted like 70, what was it, like 55, 60% of your third downs versus the Gators, and, and Vanderbilt is, is second to last in the conference, amazingly, in third down opponent conversion. If that holds, Vanderbilt's going to be in a pinch in the fourth quarter. If it flips, then it's going to be a competitive game in the fourth quarter. And he's been competitive uh, just about every week. If it is competitive in the fourth quarter and it does come down to a kick, say say 44 yards or so, how would the Doors feel about their ability to make that one? Uh, I think we're going to feel good if it's 54. Okay. Uh, I think we might even feel good if it's 60. <laughs> uh, Brock, Brock Taylor is our, our starting uh, kicker. Uh, he is in his first season 
uh, and he already has set the program record for most career 50-yard field goals. I think it's five. Uh, let's see. Yes, five 50-yard field goals uh, this season, and that is already a Vanderbilt career record. So uh, if we need a field goal late, uh, we, we feel okay. Uh, now, he's missed some early, but he, he definitely settled in. That's interesting. I did not realize that. I hadn't gotten that far into the stat sheet yet this late in the week, so appreciate you shedding some light on that. Y'all travel safe down here to Baton Rouge, and have a great call. Thanks, Andrew. Of course. Happy to talk. He's Andrew Allegretta, voice of the Vanderbilt Commodores. I, again, I've said this a couple times this week. Um, I'm not as impressed with Vanderbilt's ability to beat Alabama as I am as impressed with Vanderbilt's ability to beat Alabama and play Texas to a one-score game and go up there and take it to Kentucky and to beat Virginia Tech and to go to Auburn and win. and like They're just solid every week. And this is something I've probably written more at LouisianaSports.net than I've said on the air this week. Sometimes that kind of gets gets muddled what I've done over there and what I've done over here. But it's a Vanderbilt team statistically that doesn't look good at all in terms of total offense, total defense, rushing defense, rushing off. Like most of the statistics are not good. But as he mentioned at the top of that interview, they're great at time of possession. They're great on third down. They're great in the red zone. And that's how they keep things close. They keep the ball. They get into third and one or two. They keep the ball a little bit longer. They've matriculated down the field. Now they get into the red zone. They score points in the red zone. Pavi has only thrown three interceptions. Like, it's not a high-flying offense. It's not a stingy defense. There's not a lot of highlight real plays down the field. It's just, it's just methodical. And it's not dominant. And yeah, they got beat by Georgia State. And yeah, they got smoked by South Carolina. They couldn't, couldn't hang in that game. But They've been pretty solid all year, and I, I can't say the same for LSU, especially over the last three weeks. So um, it should be interesting on Saturday, and we appreciate Andrew for giving us a little bit of time. If you want to check that interview out, you missed it, uh, missed, caught the end of it there, and want to hear it on demand, you can find it on YouTube at Hunt on LSU a little bit later. All right, now let's talk some Pitt Panthers basketball. LSU and Pitt from the Green Buyer tomorrow. This Pitt team's real good, y'all. We'll talk about them coming up next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electrical Services. Give yourself the peace of mind to know that your power is not going to go out. You can do that with the folks at Boudreaux's Electrical. They're a certified Generac generator dealer, a premier Generac generator dealer. How about this? This is just one of the perks of working with Boudreaux's Electrical for your Generac generator. They monitor your generator 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They've got the technology to do it. So even if you don't know, because you're at home and you're not aware, but the generator mechanically fails, even if it's not supposed to spring into action, they'll know, they'll call you, say, hey, we noticed something's up with the generator. Let us come out and work on it. And they've got more than 10 techs out in the field at a given time that can come out and service your generator to make sure that when you need that generator, that it springs into action. It's the Christmas season coming up here. You probably got a lot of folks coming to the house. You don't want to deal with a power outage. That's the case. Get that Generac generator installed at your home or your business today and call the folks at Boudreaux Electrical or check out on their website online at boudreauxelectrical.com. That's boudreauxelectrical.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets. Working towards the weekend, Thursday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Fighting Tigers headed up to the Greenbrier in West Virginia. They'll play a game tomorrow at 1.30 Central Time against the Pitt Panthers and another one on Sunday, depending on the outcome of that game, as well as Wisconsin and Central Florida. But first up, Pitt Panthers on Friday afternoon. Stephen Thompson covers Pitt Panthers for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and gives us a little bit of time now on the Gems Farms Hotline. Stephen, thanks for a little bit of time. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. It is our pleasure. First of all, like, how's the city of Pittsburgh feeling about Paul Skeens these days? We uh, we like him down here. Yeah, we we like him quite a bit. Um, <laughs> it helps that he's got a little bit of celebrity star power uh, on his arm in Livy Dune. So uh, people have certainly enjoyed having both of them around. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not pulling for the Pirates as a Cubs fan, but we do love some Paul Skeens down here, and uh, we, we were uh, thrilled that he was the uh, Rookie of the Year earlier this week. But let's talk some basketball now. Pittsburgh and LSU, the Panthers are off to an awesome start. I watched a little bit of that game against West Virginia. Uh, what's been the most impressive of this unbeaten start for Pittsburgh? 
Yeah, uh, it's the margin of victory, I guess you could say. I mean, so, you know, you're beating up on a bunch of teams like BMI or Gardner-Webb or Murray State, uh, but then, you know, that West Virginia win was kind of eye-opening. Um, you know, West Virginia is rebuilding, new head coach, uh, not a ton of size on that team, and Pitt, who's older, uh, one of the older teams in Division One, one of the bigger teams in terms of length and stuff like that, was kind of able to just beat up on them a little bit, out-muscle them, out-physical them. Um, so a lot was made about how Pitt, you know, performed in the non-conference schedule last year, and their uh, their motto coming into the year was leave no doubt. And uh, you can say through five games, they have left no doubt. Um, they have certainly looked like a team that uh, is eager to make a statement. And that's what this weekend's going to be for them. It's, it's a step up in weight class and a chance for them to really make a statement against what I think is a pretty good field at the Greenbrier. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good opportunity uh, this time of the year for some teams to get a sense of, of what uh, where they are. Both Pitt and LSU have passed their first big test. LSU went to Kansas State, got a dominant win, and Pittsburgh, as you mentioned, whitewashed uh, West Virginia there at home. I want to talk about these three guards because they jump off the stat sheet and the highlight reel when you watch. Jalen Love, Ishmael Leggett, and Damian Dunn. Uh, what's been so oppressive about that trio thus far? Yeah, uh, you know, Dunn has fit in really seamlessly as the transfer from Houston um, into the starting lineup. Um, you know, he didn't know if he was going to start or if he was going to be, you know, a six-man option. Uh, Pitts had back-to-back ACC six men of the year. Um, so you figured Dunn would maybe be an option in that way. But no, he was a starter uh, in the first game, has added a really impressive scoring punch. Um, he's a good defender. He's physical. Um, and, you know, just the way they play, Dunn, Lowe, and Leggett can kind of get you buckets from all over the floor. Um, all of them kind of have a little bit of a mid-range game. They can get to the rim, um, and they shoot the three decently well uh, with kind of varying success across the board, um, which helps when, you know, the rest of this offense is really centered around taking threes and layups. Maybe Cam Corrin, who's the new starting center, can get you a bucket down low, but um, these three guards are kind of the offensive engines. Um, they have the ball in their hands most of the time. They're bringing it up the floor, and uh, it gives them a lot of versatility, which they didn't have last year. Um, if you don't know Pitt very well, they had Blake Hinson, who was one of the leading scorers in the ACC, shot a ton of threes, um, but he was the guy. And when he wasn't going, uh, it was tough to find offense in some other ways. So they're a lot deeper this year, and it starts with those three guards. Is there a go-to guy when Pitt needs a bucket, or we haven't had him in a close game where they needed a bucket, so we're not really sure? Yeah, I think you're right about that. You know, they haven't played in enough close games to really be tested in that way. But uh, judging off of last year, uh, you know, Lowe and Leggett were there last year. I'd say those should top two. But I got, I became really impressed with the way Leggett uh, was able to get them a tough bucket when they went on a scoring drought, which there were certainly plenty of those last year. Um, he's just so physical. Um, he's able to drive through guards, forwards, centers, uh, all the same, and get to the cup, get a, get a shot on the rim at the very least. Um, so I would say him. Um, he's a much improved shooter from three as well. Uh, so I'd say Ishmael Leggett, if you know it really does come down to the wire, he's the one that they're going to lean on. Guillermo Diaz-Graham, seven-footer, uh, who's been out there and has made a three in all four games, actually. Uh, what can you tell us about his game in the front court? Yeah, 40% shooter from three last year, so the threes aren't really all that surprising, but They've really challenged him to expand the offensive game, you know, uh, find some opportunities to put the ball on the floor, maybe add a mid-range game, but also be a little bit more physical. Um, that West Virginia game, it was really funny. He actually uh, took an elbow, I think, to the face, ended up getting a flagrant foul uh, uh, on a West Virginia player, had to go to the locker room, get two stitches, uh, came back out and had a double-double. Um, and he told us after the game, after he took that elbow to the face, he was, quote, ready to kill, um, which I thought was awesome. But, uh, you know, Jeff Capel said that he loved seeing that fire from him. They want him to be more physical. They want him to be a little tougher. He's seven foot, but a little thin, a little lanky. So I think they love seeing uh, the aggressiveness from him and hope that he can keep that up moving forward. The offensive numbers are eye-popping. They scored over 88, um, and they've really been good and efficient from two and from three. What about defense for this Pitt team? Is that uh, expected to be a strength? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think they've been a better defensive team this year than they have an offensive team. Um, They've really – Jeff Capel challenged them, I think, after the first game and after uh, their exhibition game against Point Park, a local, I believe, D3 school from uh, here in Pittsburgh. But – he just didn't think their on-ball defense was good enough. Um, he thought the communication was poor, but they've really stepped it up uh, over the past couple of games. So they've got a ton of length. Like I said, they're a little bit older, too. Um, and, this, you know, these guys who 
you know, a lot of new faces. They're replacing, they're adding I think, three new start, two new starters, excuse me, uh, into the lineup and a bunch of other new faces off of the bench. So I, I'm not surprised that as they've gotten some more time on the floor together, that the communication uh, and the on-ball defense, their ability to guard ball screens and uh, work with the different type of coverages that they want to play with, uh, that at that has gotten better uh, over the, the first couple weeks of the season as well. Forgive me, I know I stayed in Pittsburgh when LSU played in Morgantown back in 2011, so I know that's not a long drive. I don't know how far it is from Pittsburgh to the Greenbrier, and I don't know how big the Greenbrier facility is, but do you expect a sort of a home environment at a 1.30 or 2.30 that time uh, uh, tip-off tomorrow? Um, I would say not so much. Um, It's about a a five-and-a-half-hour drive from Pittsburgh. I know my partner, Chris Carter, also from the Post-Gazette, is going to be covering that game. Uh, well, the basketball, while well, I'm in Louisville this weekend to see our football team. Um, but I, I don't think I would expect necessarily a, a home pit crowd. Uh, there might be a few people going down to spend the weekend, but it's a bit of a hike. And uh, the, also, the other thing is the Steelers play tonight, so I'm not sure many people are going to be getting up early to make that trip down for a 2.30 start uh, on, uh, on Friday afternoon. Understood. That's exactly why I asked. Stephen, we really appreciate some time. Uh, safe travels. Enjoy the football this weekend, and we'll try to do it again soon. Thanks so much. It was good talking to you. Stephen Thompson of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette talking about these Pitt Panthers. I did a lot of research on this Pitt team. I obviously didn't research how far the Greenbrier was from Pittsburgh. I didn't realize five hours, that's quite a hike. I didn't think that Pittsburgh was five hours from anywhere in West Virginia because, like I mentioned, we stayed right across the street from PNC Park in 2011 and drove down the hour and change to Morgantown uh, for that game that uh, that LSU won on the football field. But I, I did look at this Pitt team quite extensively, and I'm going to have a piece up later this afternoon uh, previewing this game from from my perspective, and this is a good pit team. they got three, as we mentioned, really good guards. They've got some size. They have beaten the brakes off everybody they've played. Um, I, I think this team is better than the Kansas State team LSU played. The environment will be different because that was a true road game, and this is, we just talked to Steven, won't be quite that environment, but um, I think uh, I think this is a great test for LSU, and if they can play this game really tight maybe pull it out in the end, uh, that would be a huge win and a feather in the cap for, for Matt McMahon. As I mentioned, um, after the K-State game, and even on yesterday's show, after they edged out a, a bad Charleston Southern team, your your goal in November and December is to avoid the landmines and just pick a couple of these big ones off. Not all of them. You don't have to win them all. LSU does not have to go 2-0 and this weekend. You don't need to go 0-2. 1-1, one one, I'd probably sign up for that. Um but if you can go 2-0, that'd just be incredible. So I'm very excited to watch that game tomorrow. It'll tip off in about 24 hours from right now. And uh, we'll kind of get another answer as to where this LSU basketball team is in uh, in year three of the Matt McMahon era. So we'll come back, uh, look at a mock draft. Where's Will Campbell? And we'll get you best win and worst loss in the college football ranks and the National Football League. That's all next on The Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Genesis of Baton Rouge. Genesis of Baton Rouge.com. Airline at Piku. The buying experience at Genesis of Baton Rouge is phenomenal. I think a lot of times when you think about buying a car, you think about pulling up on the lot and the salesman smothers you at your car and they're trying to tell you about all these incredible deals. That's not how it's going to be at Genesis of Baton Rouge. They understand what the car buying experience should be like. You're going to feel like a guest as opposed to a customer when you're at Genesis of Baton Rouge. They're happy to help you at whatever level you'd like that help. If you want to walk around the lot and just check things out, you can do that. If you'd like some help from one of their brand ambassadors, they'll be right there to assist you. But you don't even have to go to the the lot at Genesis of Baton Rouge. They'll come to you. If you go to genesisofbatonrouge.com, you do a little bit of research, you think that there's a vehicle there, because everyone, every car that's on the lot is online. If you see one, they'll drive it to you. Hey, here you go. You can test drive it with one of their brand ambassadors from the office, from the house. Don't have to go to the dealership, but I highly recommend that you do because it's a gorgeous state-of-the-art facility there, airline and Piku. But as I mentioned, start that journey of buying a vehicle at genesisofbatonrouge.com. Genesis of Baton Rouge. Genesisofbatonrouge.com. You're listening to the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Rouse's Supermarkets.
new mock draft just dropped because there's never a bad time for a mock draft, right? Just churn them out ESPN style. Matt Miller, ESPN uh, NFL draft analyst, dropped one today, and I was just kind of perusing through it for Saints and LSU uh, related content. Um, did have the Saints picking 11th here and uh, said they'd go with Jalen Walker. Defensive end, outside linebacker from Georgia. Can play some off the ball, can play some on the edge. Feels like potentially a replacement for Cam Jordan-ish, Demario Davis-ish. Just kind of depends on how you want to use him. So he doesn't have great size, but his first step, speed, and power have helped him to five and a half sacks. I like him as a stand-up rushing role in a 3-4 scheme if New Orleans' new regime goes that route. It's another thing about doing Saints mock drafts right now. You don't even know what kind of defense they want to play because they, they don't have any coaches lined up at this point. So uh, says Jalen Walker for the Saints at number 11. Look, anybody that Kirby Smart recruits, uh, develops over three or four years, I'll, I'll take my chances with, uh, with the Saints at number 11. So interesting there. As you move down the list, you can finally see Will Campbell, and they've got him going number 17 to the Seahawks. This is the first time I've actually seen this written about Will Campbell, however. Uh, says that he uh, he has short-ish, uh, short-ish arms, and he's had some issues with outside speed rushers, and many scouts now believe he could be a guard in the pros. I have not seen anybody that has written that yet uh, about Seattle, but they do write in this one that the Seahawks lost Damian Lewis in free agency. He could potentially fill in there. Of course, Damian Lewis on the uh, Joe Moore winning offensive line back in 2019. So Will Campbell there at 17 to the Seattle Seahawks. Par- Carson Beck right behind him uh, at number 18 to the Rams. But I was perusing through this to see if, if anybody else for LSU might show up, whether it be Emory Jones, whether it be Harold Perkins. And as you continue to scroll through the first round, there is nobody else from LSU that is listed in this mock draft anymore. And that, to me, is telling. Uh, I I don't think it's shocking, but it's telling about where this team is and and why they haven't necessarily achieved to the degree that you would like. There are multiple Texas A&M defensive linemen, Shamar Stewart and Nick Scorton on this list. There are multiple Ole Miss defensive linemen on this list. Um, You're talking about teams that have more talent than you that you're playing week in and week out. And I think that's evident when you watch the games. I think it's evident when you just understand what you're looking at when you watch LSU. And I think it, it makes sense when you uh, when you read these mock drafts. So uh, curious how that was going to shake out. And we'll, we'll do some more mock drafts later on down the road. But that was the one that dropped today. It's time for best win, worst loss. Best win in college football. This didn't take long. I didn't even research it. Because it's very rare that I can come on here and talk about a best win in college football. And it would be the greatest win in the history of the program. And if Indiana wins on Saturday, that's the best win in the history of the program. They go to Columbus, remain unbeaten, 11-0 and against Ohio State. That's the best win in Indiana football history. So that makes it the best win on the board this week in college football. Worst loss, I will stay in the Big Ten. This may be a reputation play here, maybe a little bit, but I, I think it holds true. If Penn State loses this game to Minnesota on the road, that's probably the worst loss. I can make the case for Colorado against Kansas. Um, there are other cases to be made. A&M dropping out of the playoff by losing to Auburn. Like There are other other ones out there, but Penn State has had a tendency to do this. Miami, again, if they can, I mean, they're playing yeah, Lake Forest. That, that would qualify as well, but I'm going to go with Penn State against Minnesota here because really all they told you, Penn State, is you don't have to beat anybody that's super good. Just don't lose to the crappy teams and you're in the playoffs. And that's what you've got on your plate coming up this weekend. So best win in the NFL. I kind of struggled with this one. There, there's a lot of good teams against bad teams this week. Uh, we'll probably get to that tomorrow more so than anything. But a lot of games that are a little bit mismatches. Um, so best win was tougher. I think the 49ers, even though they're 5-5, five and five, going to Lambeau and getting a win over a good Packers team probably would suffice as the best win on the board. They've got Christian McCaffrey back. That should get Debo Samuel a little bit of a rhythm. I hope so because he's on my fantasy team and he hasn't done squat. But the 49ers have struggled because of injuries and whatnot. If they go to Lambeau and win, I think that would be pretty impressive. Worst loss, this is pretty commonplace. But because of last week and because of the teams nipping on their heels, the Chiefs losing at the Panthers would be the worst loss. The Chiefs could probably have afforded a loss to the Panthers if they would have gone to Buffalo and won because they would have knocked Buffalo down a rung, they would have stayed undefeated, and they would have had a lot of breathing room over the last six weeks of the season. Now that's tightened because we know that Buffalo continues to play really well. The Chargers have a good record. The Ravens are very good. 
if they want the road to go through Arrowhead, you got to take care of your business, and this is one you've got to take care of your business on. So, worst loss would be the Chiefs at the, the, the Panthers. The Chiefs are ten and a half point favorites on the road. That doesn't seem like enough. I mean, on the road, if they're at home, they'd be thirteen or fourteen. So, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I it guess it does. But I mean, it, it, what does that feel like? I mean, the Chiefs' offense hasn't been that great, quite frankly. Their defense is better than their offense. The defense wasn't great against Josh Allen, but nobody's playing good defense against Josh well, Allen. They, the so. Panthers, uh, two wins in a row, huh? Beat the Saints, beat the Giants. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Super good. Great job by them. That franchise is really going places. <laughs> like the first pick in the draft, probably. Um, so best win in the college football, Indiana over Ohio State. Worst loss in college football, Penn State at Minnesota. Let's go row the boat. Best win in the NFL, 49ers going to Lambeau Field and winning over the Packers. And the worst loss, Chiefs at the Panthers. If you missed any of the first hour, it was fast moving. Uh, we opened things up. My thoughts, can the Saints make the playoffs? In summation, no, I don't think they can. That's probably not breaking news to you, but I wanted to go through the exercise, and now we've done it. If you're curious of how I arrived at that conclusion and not just the fact that they lost seven games in a row during the season, you can check it out on YouTube at Hunt on Saints. Andrew Allegretta, the voice of the Vanderbilt Commodores, had a lot of interesting things to say uh, about Vanderbilt and what they've done this year, some of their strengths on offense, what they're trying to do, who some of their playmakers are, and then the defense and how they've been able to kind of hold it their ground, even though it's not a team that's star-studded and going to throw a bunch of guys in the first and second round of the draft. So if you want to hear about uh, the scouting report of Vanderbilt, you can check that out uh, on YouTube at Hunt on LSU. Stephen Thompson, I thought was great, although he's probably walking around downtown uh, with the wind blowing a little bit, but I thought he was good uh, talking about Pittsburgh, who LSU will play in 23 hours and 30 minutes over at the Greenbrier in West Virginia. So you can catch that if you're looking for your LSU hoops fix. Then a little mock draft talk and best win, worst loss to close it all out. Wherever you missed it, you can catch it on demand wherever you find your podcast. In the second hour, Chris Blair, voice of the Tigers at 215. We'll talk some hoops and, of course, LSU and Vanderbilt football. Luke Johnson talking Saints at 230. When we come back on the other side of Sports Center, I want to get into LSU's red zone woes. I went into some of the numbers. We have some thoughts from some of the players. So we'll do that after we step aside for Sports Center. It's the Thursday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Presented by Rouse's Markets. The Hunt Palmer Show. LaBerge, Baton Rouge, got to make it. Your game day headquarters this season. They've got the biggest screens around, and now you can bet and dine at ESPN Bet in person. Their pizzas are awesome. I like them a lot. The beer towers they got on Thursdays, it happens to be Thursday, $11. There's like nine beers in it. It's a fantastic place to go get some food, get some cold to drink, watch awesome sports. You can gamble. Blackjack right behind you. The seating arrangements are great for groups or individuals. I've spent a few Thursdays there at ESPN Bat, and you should too at LaBerge in Baton Rouge. And as always, I invite you to sign up today for the Cover 5 SEC contest. You're not going to be able to win the season-long contest on November the 21st, but you can win weekly prizes, and you can compete against me and dozens of our listeners. The code is LABRSEC24. Again, that's LABRSEC24 on the Cover 5 app. If you're not a member, get the Pin Play app today. LaBear's Baton Rouge, your live sports headquarters. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-589-9966 for help. 